Welcome back to Plant-Based Kidney Health. I'm Michelle Cross, my renal dietitian here with Dr. Hashmi, nephrologist. And we have a very important topic today that we're talking about, and it's how to lower your blood potassium levels. And it's so relevant for many people with kidney disease. A lot of people don't struggle with this, but many people do. And oftentimes, you know, diets blamed and we don't think about non-dietary things that can impact blood potassium levels. So we're going to dive into um, all of those aspects. So if you're someone who struggles with high blood potassium, you know what steps you can take to help lower that. Um, so to start it off, Dr. Hashmi, why do we care about our blood potassium levels and why does it seem to be such a struggle in people with kidney disease to then control those levels? So, so great, great topic, first of all, and very, very important because potassium is an electrolyte and it is so darn important because it has so many functions. So let's talk a little bit about why should you care about potassium? And then after that, let's get into some more details about all the other things we want to know about it. So the first thing you want to know about potassium and why it's so critical to the body is it's very important playing fluid balance. So in other words, you talk about sodium, but there are sodium potassium exchangers in the body, and there are all sorts of other potassium exchangers. And what happens with these exchangers is that's one of the mechanisms on how fluid ends up falling. So in other words, potassium helps to maintain the balance of your body's fluids. And it works really closely in terms of sometimes in polar opposites with the sodium inside your body to regulate that. And so as it's regulating that, it also is very important for regulating things like blood pressure. So we know that a diet rich in potassium actually is very good for lowering blood pressure. Number two is when it comes to your nerves, when it comes to your muscle cell functioning, potassium is critical in both of these areas. So potassium will help to send the signals in your nerves. It allows the muscle cells to contract. Anybody who's ever had low potassium levels and gotten really bad cramps can know how painful those are. And we end up treating that with Potassium. So this is why sometimes when you'll get an electrolyte solution or you're drinking Gatorade or et cetera going on, they'll have salt, they'll have water, they'll have sugar, and they'll have potassium in there. And oftentimes some of those drinks also have magnesium in there. Now, the other part of this is potassium is critical to have the heart function normally. So if you have a significant drop in potassium or a significant spike in potassium, you can get all sorts of heart rhythm problems. So speaking of heart rhythms, the heartbeat itself is regulated based on potassium channels. So the heart needs potassium. So potassium is one of those things that too little or too much ends up being really bad. And to regulate that heartbeat, potassium plays a critical role in the electrical impulse or the electrical signal that's needed to keep our heart beating at the lub-dub, lub-dub, that that dance that it does all day long for our entire lives. So if the potassium, once again, is too high, you can get very dangerous and critical arrhythmias, and we'll get to that in a second. Then the fourth thing to note is acid-base balance. So potassium is really important in keeping the balance between the acid and the base levels in the right place. And as it exchanges with things like protons, for example, it helps in terms of regulating the acidity or the alkalinity that may exist. And then the last portion of why potassium matters so much to us is because when we talk about metabolic processes, whether that's the breakdown of foods, specifically carbohydrates we eat or protein synthesis, potassium is really important. So as you can see with just these five items that I've listed, potassium is absolutely critical and getting it right in the body is absolutely critical. And so what happens, why is potassium sometimes too low or too high for someone with kidney disease? Yeah, so this is really interesting because, you know, kidneys job is to be able to regulate the potassium. And as you get worsening kidney disease, the clearance of potassium starts to go down. Now, keep in mind that from your cells, you can have shifting of potassium inside the cells to outside the cells. And if for those of you guys listening, if you look at our channel, we have some really good videos that talk about how potassium shifts in and out. But essentially, the amount of potassium that's inside cells 
is magnitudes higher than what's inside your blood. So if those cells break, you get a crush injury, trauma, all of those things could release enough potassium that it could essentially kill you very, very quickly. And that's why crush injuries are such a big deal. Now, there's a lot of medications that can cause the kidneys to hold on to potassium. Also, the acid level in your blood, the more acid you have, the more you're going to drive potassium out of cells and into the blood. So potassium gets regulated by so many different things that patients, especially with kidney disease, they struggle. And when you have kidney disease, that's the one time where the diet matters a lot. In everybody else, it's really difficult to get high potassium levels because of the fact that the kidneys do such a remarkable job. But in patients with CKD, especially advanced CKD, stage four, stage five, they get high potassium levels because the kidneys aren't doing their job. In dialysis patients, what's fascinating is, is as the kidneys are no longer working, the amount of potassium that leaves your body increases in stool. So your GI tract becomes one of the bigger mechanisms for getting rid of potassium. But one of the biggest problems that are our patients with dialysis tell us is they have constipation. Part of that reason is, is everything we tell them to eat, which Michelle has expressed so many times, is actually backwards to helping their bowels move. So most of the white flours, the white refined grains, everything that we're telling them, hoping that we hit one marker, ends up slowing down their GI tract. And as a result of it, their potassiums go higher, even though you would expect them to go lower because they can't have a bowel movement. Yeah. And we've talked about that in multiple episodes, but just to throw it out there again, that that's an old and outdated renal diet recommendation that you have to have those white grain products. Um, Whole grains are okay for people with kidney disease. And even on dialysis, it just comes down to which ones fit into your potassium needs. So, and we're going to, we're going to get more into the diet side of it. Cause obviously that has a big part in our um, blood potassium levels, but aside from diet, from a more medical side, if someone has high blood potassium levels, um, or let's even say low, but what from a diet, from a non-diet standpoint, can someone do to help lower? Yeah. Levels? So let's, you know, when you <clears throat> have either high or low potassium levels, the first thing is you want to talk to your doctor. This is really important because there may be medications that may be causing either or that we have to adjust, or there may be other conditions that we have to investigate. For example, there are conditions like hyperaldosteronism, which cause low potassium and cause your body to hold on to sodium. So you might have high blood pressure and low potassium simply because there's an underlying condition and we have very specific medications to treat that. But what you really want to understand is there's two categories. The first is emergency. Emergency is is when the potassium is really high. So absolutely, if the potassium is greater than 6.5, that's just critical. You know, we don't wait. If the potassium is above 5.5, we absolutely treat it. The normal range is about three and a half to five, but if we start going above 5.5, we focus on trying to treat it. And the higher it is above that, the more we look at it as an emergent situation. So emergency treatment is things like IV calcium. We give it through the vein. And the reason we give the calcium is because it's going to stabilize the heart membrane. It works very fast, less than 15 minutes, but it doesn't last very long, about 30 to 60 minutes. Now, once again, This is because we're dealing in an emergency and we have to make sure that the heart doesn't go into an arrhythmia. The other thing we end up doing is giving people insulin, of course, with glucose so that we can go ahead and drive the potassium inside the cells. And what this ends up doing is, is on average, it can lower the potassium by about one milliequivalent per liter. So in other words, you can get about one point reduction. So if it's five and a half, you could bring it down to four and a half with insulin with glucose. You have to be careful because you got to make sure the insulin wasn't too much, that the the person is now becoming hypoglycemic, etc. And then the third thing, which we actually don't use that much anymore. When I first started training, I used to do it. But the reason we don't is, is because the heart rate goes really fast. And that's the use of beta agonists like albuterol, for example. Now, the onset is really fast, about 30 minutes. 
They last about four to six hours. They can lower the potassium somewhere between half a point to about a point, point and a half. But the risk is, is a lot of our patients have underlying cardiac disease, and we don't necessarily want to make their hearts beat really fast. So that's the emergency situation. Now, if we go to the other side, which is more of the chronic thing, is we have a number of things we can do. So for sort of the the shorter term side, we can give people bicarbonate therapy. If they tend to run more acidic, they have more acid, meaning their bicarb on their blood test is low. We can give them things like sodium bicarbonate. Of course, nature sodium bicarbonate is better than anything, which is fruits and vegetables. So what we call a plant-based diet or an alkaline diet is a bicarbonate rich diet to begin with. So you can focus on doing that and that can help. But some people require diuretics. Diuretics are, are medicines that will make you pee more. Classically, the examples are things like loop diuretics, for example, Lasix or thiazide diuretics, classically like hydrochlorothiazide. And the idea behind them is they will take out water from the body and they'll take potassium with it. So diuretics can work. But other things are things like essentially stuff that we use for the gut to be able to exchange the potassium or pull the potassium out of the body. And those are things like pterimer or also known as veltasa. There's kexalate, which is still used a lot. There's lokelma, which is another sort of newer kid on the block. So all of those things are there to help you chronically. And you'll see patients on them on a regular basis <coughs> for short or intermediate term to be able to help to <clears throat> continuously remove potassium. And then, of course, sometimes we just need to dialyze the patient, and that can be done in an emergency basis. Or patients who are already on dialysis, sometimes we need to do it longer or more frequently. Okay, so now that we've covered sort of the non-diet portion, Michelle, can you talk to us about a low-potassium diet? What does it mean? Milligrams per meal? snacks? How do you track it? Let's get into the diet side of it. Yeah. And I think it's important to uh, emphasize, like you said, it is potassium is still important for our body for multiple different reasons. So it's not a no potassium diet. Sometimes I hear people like, I can't eat potassium. You no, know, it's just low potassium. It's not no potassium. So technically a low potassium diet can be anywhere from 2000 milligrams to about 3000 milligrams of potassium per day. The reason that it's a range is one, because we don't eat the exact same thing typically every single day in the exact same amount. Um, but also because someone, one person, maybe they're smaller, um, for whatever reason, they can only handle that 2000 milligrams that would be low potassium for them. And you might have a much bigger person that 3000 milligrams of potassium. So it's a range for that reason. Um, and when we think of how that spreads out, that can be anywhere from about 500 to 800 milligrams of potassium per meal and 100 to 200 milligrams of potassium per snack. Now that's roughly someone eating two to three meals a day and one to two snacks a day. Of course, that's, I think it's important to take, if you were told you need to follow a low potassium diet, then you can use those ranges um, and then see where you fall. If you only eat two meals a day, then you might be able to do 700, 800 milligrams of potassium per meal and then have two snacks at 200 milligrams. If you eat three meals and three snacks a day, then you likely have to do you know, 500, 600 milligrams of potassium per meal, and maybe only 100 milligrams for your snack. So how do you even know though, what you're having or what you should have? That's where tracking, not every day, not all day, but I think for most people, um, I like the chronometer or chronometer. That is a really good application. There's the free version of it, or you can of course do the desktop version on your computer, but track for three days, what you typically eat, put it into chronometer and see where you're falling. Um, I like chronometer better than a lot of other ones because they, you can choose, you can see the database that it's pulling from. So it, a lot of times like my fitness pal or other people can put their own entries in and they might put an entry in that they didn't include the potassium information. So now it's saying zero milligrams potassium, but it might actually have 
500 milligrams of potassium. So, but overall you track for a couple of days and look and see where you're falling. And I think one of the important things, and again, diet gets so much blame and diet is so important, but most people don't get enough potassium in their diet. They're being, you know, they're, they're, or not potassium from the fruits and veggies and whole plant foods that we want them to get it from because it's coming along with other benefits like um, a more alkalizing, which can also help with controlling potassium levels or providing fiber, which helps promote regular bowel movements and prevent constipation, which also helps control potassium levels. So it's really important to know, track and see where you're falling. And then just look at your meals. If you track and you look at dinner, you're like, oh my gosh, that was 1200 milligrams of potassium. Um, that's more than half of what I need in a day on a low potassium diet. Then look at what you had in that meal. If you had artichokes and Brussels sprouts, well, those are both high potassium vegetables. Can you change it for cauliflower and green beans instead? And sometimes just making small adjustments like that. If you're snacking, you know, it's hot out and fruit is a really great snack to have. If you're snacking on a whole bunch of melon and cantaloupe, those are very high potassium fruit. Can you switch it to pineapple and strawberries? So oftentimes if you know where you are, then you can make those small adjustments. So it doesn't seem like, oh, I have to go to eating white rice and canned corn and boiled chicken, like the old renal diet recommendation was. Um, a, a few other really important things and where I've seen people get into trouble with their diet and potassium is that they eat a lot of very high potassium foods. So they'll get fixated on sweet potatoes or avocados or cooked spinach or um, cantaloupe, like I said, and they'll just eat so much of it throughout the day that they're having, you know, 5,000, 6,000 milligrams of potassium intake for the day. And then that's contributing to their blood levels being elevated. The other thing I usually say is don't drink your potassium. You know, we're not, we're usually saying not to have fruit juices or, um, you know, be careful what you put in your smoothie or don't get that green juice from whatever, you know, restaurant or store. Sometimes those are very concentrated amounts of potassium that can contribute to higher potassium levels. And then the other really important thing is look for potassium salts and potassium additives on food labels. You have to look at the ingredient list, anything with potassium in it. Like when we say anything with phosphorus in the ingredient list, we want to avoid. Same thing with those potassium salts. It might be potassium chloride. It might be potassium phosphate, um, whatever it is, those are more readily absorbed in the gut. And so we don't want to get our potassium from something like a potassium salt that is not going to give us antioxidants and vitamins and minerals and fiber. We want that to come from fruits, veggies, and other whole plant foods. So from a dietary standpoint, diet is so important, but even if you're on a low potassium diet, it's not no potassium. And we still want to have a nutrient dense diet that's full of fruits and veggies. It's just choosing the lower potassium options instead of the higher potassium ones. So I think that kind of summarizes the diet side. Anything, Dr. Hashmi, you want to summarize from the medical side of it? No, I think just, just the take home <clears throat> lesson on the medical side is if you have low or high potassium, please talk to your provider. It's not something you want to try to fix yourself. Let us be the experts to guide you. This is why you have your doctors and your dietitians and all that team together. So that's a very important take home point. Yeah. Oh, I do have one more question that I, people will ask a lot. So let's say someone has high blood potassium and they, whether they were put on a medication to help lower it, or they've made dietary changes or both, how soon after a medication or dietary changes should they have potassium checked again to make sure it's come down? Yeah. Generally speaking, you know, when we're worried about it, we'll recheck in in about one to two weeks. That's a standard time frame. It takes at least about five days to have a noticeable change. But remember, that's when the potassium is slightly elevated. Of course, if it's critically high, like we talked about those earlier situations, we treat it emergently and then we repeat it immediately after to make sure it's coming down. And even after the patient goes home, we'll ask him to repeat it the next day or the day after just to make sure that it's truly in a safer place. But in general, one to two weeks is a very reasonable thing. Your provider may give you a more specific timeline than that. But in my own clinical practice, when the potassium is a little bit up and I'm making either dietary changes or medication changes, I repeat the levels in one to two weeks. Okay, perfect. Thanks for clarifying that. There you guys have it, how to lower your blood potassium levels, both with medication and with diet. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks, guys.